Oh, welcome everyone. Again, to anyone that's perhaps slipped in during that time, welcome to anyone that is going to be watching this online. Uh, it's great to jump into what is going to be the beginning of a new little mini series for us as a church that we've called Flourish. Uh, and uh, we're going to do this at sort of different points throughout the year as we look and explore together ways that we can be growing as Christians, as followers of Jesus, growing in our faith, growing in our relationship with God, growing in our enjoyment of God, because that is something that's meant to go up as we are on this journey with him. And so hopefully this word flourish or flourishing is going to be a great word to get at the very heart of what it is to live the kingdom kind of life, God's kingdom kind of life. But I know, and this was uncanny because basically one of the people on the team had a kind of prophetic word, which was this next sentence <laughs> in my message. We were kind of laughing about it and thanking God for it. But I know that lots of Christians can really feel stuck in their relationship with God, where this relationship with God may have got off to a good start, and yet actually, if we're honest, it doesn't seem to have progressed in the way that we may be hoped or expected. We believe in Jesus, but in many kind of areas of our lives, we haven't seen the change that we were wanting, which can be frustrating and confusing. I think for many people, time as a Christian does not necessarily make it easier to hear and sense and know God's voice. You can have been a Christian for a long time and maybe not be finding it easier right now to know and sense and hear God's voice than it was in the beginning. And so for many people, prayer can still feel quite one-sided. We speak to God rather than speaking with God and hearing him communicate with us. Or perhaps on balance, our lives are still more kind of full of anxiety than with peace or joy. Or we pray, but we haven't really seen miracles in our lives or in the lives of people that we pray for. Uh, we try to read the Bible, but when we did, it didn't make sense. In fact, it kind of challenged our faith more than encouraging our faith. And so we kind of stopped doing it. You know, we believe in Jesus, but our lifestyle hasn't really changed much. You know, if people at work or school or wherever we were found out we were Christians, maybe they would be more surprised to find that out because we kind of live like everybody else because our faith has not yet quite made it out to all the different aspects of our lives and the way that we live. And so in this series, we want to help everybody because I think we all have this sort of, at some level at least, I hope, a desire to grow and know God in richer ways. And so what are some of the steps we can take to do that? And we want to help people to kind of scale that no matter where you are in your relationship with God. So if, if we're looking at a practice or a way to grow and it's the first time you've ever engaged with that, then we want to give you some kind of initial steps that, hey, I, I can actually do something. I can make a start. I've never done this before, but this is a doable next step for me. Or maybe this practice has kind of been bedded in in your life a little, little bit. And so you want to take the next step and kind of level that up. How can I grow even in this practice? And so we've got some ideas for how you could do that. And even for those of you who are just running with God right now, you know, you are flying with God, uh, but you want to keep growing, then hopefully there are going to be some steps for you as well in that process. So we're going to try to make sure... All of us have an opportunity to take a next step with God out of this series so that we can keep learning and keep growing and keep loving God and enjoying our relationship with him. So hopefully that sounds helpful and exciting for everybody uh, as we step in. So let me pray, okay, and, and maybe some of the faces can turn into smiles as we go. I think people are a bit worried, you know, what is Jason going to do? And so uh, let's, uh, let's jump into this together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your ways. 
We thank you that you are here to lead us and guide us as the good shepherd, that you know how to direct us towards sort of living streams and green pastures where we can be nourished. You, you set a table for us, even in the presence of our enemies, even in those seasons of life where we can feel kind of afflicted or oppressed, that God, even in the midst of those times, you create a way for us to be nourished and encouraged to grow and to flourish. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us. You know where every one of us is at. And, Lord, I pray that you would speak to each of us individually and personally today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so let's begin, as this is a bit of an introduction, I thought it's worth asking this question. Why do we even need to grow as Christians? You know, before we look at what are some of the life lessons to be able to do that, I thought this is an important question just to at least touch on. Why is growing in God important in the first place? Can't I just be a person who believes in God? Does it actually have to go any further than that? Any of you ever wondered that or maybe you've spoken to people about that question? Well, there are a host of ways we could answer that. Here are two for the sake of time. The first would be, remember what it actually means to be a Christian. We've covered this over the last couple of weeks. A Christian, according to the Bible, is someone who has chosen to trust and follow Jesus and to become one of his disciples, to be with him to become like him and learn to do what he did. So I guess you could say, if you are now so living with Jesus that you have become so like him that it's hard for the rest of us to tell the difference and that you are so doing the things that Jesus would do if he were living your life, that again, there is just no difference then maybe we could say, well, we don't need to grow anymore. We can just, like, we've reached it, you know, in which case we can swap sides because I am definitely not there. And I think if we're honest, most of us can say we're not quite there yet. And so there is a process for us as we grow with God, as his disciples. The second is to look at the language of the Bible that talks about what it is to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus, how so often... The terminology and the language the scripture uses leans into this idea of growth. That to be a Christian is to be a person that needs to keep growing. And so here's some examples. If you're taking notes, they won't be on the screen. But Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2 says this, Like newborn babies. Now, right away, we should be thinking, what happens to babies over time? They grow up, don't they? And they become adults and their food changes. You know, if you are still having the same food today as you did when you were born, you know, there's a bit of a challenge there, probably. Okay, so 1 Peter 1, chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. This encouragement to growth. Now, if we went to uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and chapter 3, good place to read. Now, remember, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church is a corrective letter. This is a church that was getting a lot wrong. Okay, so when in our lives we feel like we may be getting a lot wrong, 1 Corinthians is a good passage to go to because it's going to be Paul giving us correction. So uh, what he says here in this letter is he has to challenge the Christians who are there. He uses language like this. It's quite strong. He says, you are mere infants in Christ. And the implication is that they should be adults in, in their relationship with God, but they are still mere infants in Christ. He says that you are more worldly in other words, you are more like the world around you than you are like Jesus, who you are meant to be growing to become like. And so he challenges them to be on this journey from worldliness, as the word that he uses, or immaturity, to maturity or spiritual life. Life that looks more like Jesus. And so he paints this picture of progression. Or Hebrews chapter 5, again, if you're taking notes, you can read that chapter 
And this is perhaps even stronger, the challenge that comes to the Christians as the writer to the Hebrews says this. He says, you should be mature by now able to teach others. You should be in a position where we can be sort of eating adult food, and yet you haven't grown. You are still infants needing milk. And so he brings this challenge that we need to be on this growth trajectory from childlikeness to adulthood in our maturity and in our growth with God. In other words, we all start somewhere where our understanding on our capacity to live like Jesus is less developed. And then over time, as we follow Jesus and we allow him to disciple us, and time is not the issue. Okay? It's as we allow him to disciple us and follow him that he can transform us and we can mature to be like him. In 2 Peter chapter 1, it says this, after being told, we have everything we need to live the Jesus kind of life. Isn't that good news? One of our things here, our values, that we have been equipped by God with everything that we need to live this Jesus life. He goes on to say in verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Okay, so, you know, is it enough just to believe in Jesus? Well, we're told to add to that. Add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. And these things keep us from being ineffective, he says, in our life and journey with God. And all of this and a multitude of other scriptures throughout the New and Old Testament give us this picture that to be a follower of Jesus is to be on a lifelong journey of discovery and growth and transformation that we move, as we looked at the other week, from one degree of glory to the next. Just to say, if we think of the word mature, I'm not sure what comes to mind. Maybe some of you think, I don't think I want to be mature, uh, you know, uh, in terms of that picture. We maybe think of someone that's boring or risk averse, uh, balanced in the sense of not too intense and therefore not really doing very much. And that is not the biblical definition of maturity. The biblical picture of spiritual maturity is Jesus, loving like Jesus. Relating to God and others like Jesus, being joyful like Jesus, full of peace like Jesus, full of power like Jesus, full of confidence and boldness to walk and live out the instruction of his father. He is both the life of the party and the solid foundation that our lives can be built on and never be shaken. That is the picture of biblical maturity that hopefully we can move towards. So that as Paul says in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, that we would be able to progress in our faith and other people would be able to see it. And us too, that we would have a sense that we are growing. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we partner with God in a lifelong hope filled, joyful kind of journey of growth in our relationship with God. Well, here are some of the foundation. Here's one of the key foundational ways to grow as a disciple, and if not the foundational way to be able to grow as a follower of Jesus. And we actually get it from Jesus' lips as he's in the wilderness being tempted by the enemy. What does Jesus say about how to live as he's being challenged? He says, man, woman, mankind does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And I guess you could invert that and say, man cannot live the spirit-filled Jesus kind of life without every word that comes from the mouth of God. And now, perhaps some of you are instantly jumping to thinking about your Bibles, which is a good thing, okay? Just hold that for a moment, particularly as you can see them all out on the table here. I want you instead to imagine 
a seed. Imagine holding a seed in your hand. In fact, I've got some here. I picked the seeds that were the biggest, but even those are going to look kind of small. So here we have Sugar Anne, okay? Sugar Snap P, there we go. And it's tiny, isn't it? Okay, so imagine holding this little seed, and, and you get much smaller seeds even than this. Because one of the ways that Jesus speaks about the Word of God is he speaks about it as being like a seed. And as you plant it into the soil of your heart and tend it and water it and keep it free from weeds, it's able to grow up and produce a harvest a hundred times what is sown. And so I want you to just maybe close your eyes for a moment and imagine your heart like a field. And I want you to think about if If this is the place that we come to be spiritually nourished, to live the Jesus kind of life, I want you to look out at the field of your heart and look at the harvest that's growing there. How much have you planted in your field? How much is actually growing up? If if that field were to represent the food that you were going to be eating this year, (laughs) and you're like a farmer, and you're looking out at your heart and thinking, this is going to be what sustains me and enables me to be nourished and to grow. How much have I put into my heart with the Lord to be able to be well-fed and growing? Maybe open your eyes. How does this perhaps shift? or change the way we think about engaging with God's word, to think of them as seeds that need to be grown. Because I think this is why a lot of Christian people come unstuck and never really quite get growing in their relationship with God. Because we are used to being able to go to the supermarket when we're hungry and we buy the food and we bring it home and it's pre-grown. It maybe goes into our fridge for a couple of days. We bring it out, we make the meal and we eat it. Bang, it's fast, isn't it? Or we come to church, to kind of put this into a spiritual example, hopefully what you get from me is not the seed, but the seed that God planted in me some time ago that's now developed and there's some fruit and we can share something to eat. Does that make sense? But it hasn't come instantly. There is this process of growth. You see, coming to the Bible is a bit more like going to the nursery and buying a packet of seed than it is like going to the supermarket and buying bread that you can just take home and eat. And if you plant that seed in your heart and care for it, sometimes it takes days, sometimes it takes weeks, sometimes it takes months, sometimes it takes years before the fruit actually comes. There's a lag, but as we are faithful to sow and to trust and to care, we begin to look at the field of our hearts and it is ripe for harvest. And there's actually enough food to eat. And the reason for this is because when we read those scriptures, what God is wanting to do with us is not just give us knowledge but transform our hearts and our minds that we would be conformed to his image and become like him. They reveal God to you until one day you wake up in the morning and you look into the the sort of field of your heart and you look out and there are apples on the trees that weren't there when you were given the seed for that apple tree. And so as we read the Bible today and ask the Spirit to bless it and trust Him, there is this period that we then need to wait before we are changed. And I think this is why people can be really demoralized when you go to read the Bible for the first time. Because you go to it for a spiritual meal, okay, and you come away with this, (laughs) and it's like really disappointing, you know, how am I meant to live on that if I just eat this? It's dry and there's no, there's no life in it. You see, do you know, um, maybe some of you have heard of this idea of succession sowing in gardening, where you plant something every day. So you plant it today, and then 
in a couple of weeks, that's going to bear a harvest. And then you plant something the next day, and the next day, and, the ne and for the first couple of weeks, you've got nothing but seeds in the ground until eventually you get to that first moment of harvest. Now you are harvesting something and you sowing and harvesting and sowing and harvesting and sowing at the same time and you now have an abundance but in the beginning, it just looks like bare soil until the first thing begins to grow. Okay, now some of you are not into agriculture and planting and gardening. Let me give you another example of what this is like, how many of you have heard of SSRIs? Okay, perhaps some of you. This is a common medication that's often prescribed to help people with depression. It stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor, if you ever <laughs> wanted to know. Okay, now to simplify what is quite a complex and nuanced and sensitive process, sometimes when people are depressed, the brain literally needs physiological healing in order to be able to process things properly again, in order to function properly. And for that to happen, you need something called serotonin in the synapse of your brain. You can think of serotonin like a bridge for your thoughts to be able to cross. No bridge and no cognition, emotional kind of cognition. And so the serotonin needs to be there. Without it, the brain begins to atrophy, it doesn't work as it should. And so what this medication does, it prevents the reabsorption of serotonin into the brain to keep the bridge in operation for as long as possible so that your brain can begin to work and begin to heal. The challenge with these medications is the side effects kick in straight away, often. But there is a lag before the healing kicks in. It takes time for your brain to be healed. And so that can take weeks, sometimes even months before you feel better. It's a bit like taking a seed towards healing. And you have to trust that it's going to work, that eventually the bridge is going to be in place for long enough that you wake up one morning, and people often describe it like this. It's like, I felt horrible, I felt horrible, I felt horrible. And then one day you wake up and it's like there's color in the world again. Because your brain has been restored. And you see, our soul needs to be healed. And it's healed by the word of God being planted into the soil of our hearts and giving it time to grow. But in the beginning, we often just get the side effects to start with of reading the Bible. I am confused right now. You know, I don't get it. I don't feel different. In fact, sometimes I don't even like it. I, it's like this is more of a challenge to my faith than a help. It makes me feel uncomfortable. And yet, if you persevere, the fruit will come. And one day you wake up and things just begin to make sense. See, this is why there is no shortcut to this process. And every Christian and every church and every nation that steps away from the scriptures, you know, eventually the wheels begin to fall off. And again, there's the lag. It doesn't happen instantly. A bit like people taking the SSRIs as well. Because this takes time. Because if I, if I have been sowing and I stop sowing today, I still get to eat everything that I've sown the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before that. So I stop reading the Bible, but I don't instantly feel awful because I'm still benefiting from what's been sown into my life over a period of time. Or the churches that leave the Bible still benefit from what's been faithfully sown in over history. Or nations that leave the Bible still benefit. There is this lag until one day you get to the point where you've eaten everything that was sown. And now there's nothing left. And your soul begins to starve. And there is no spiritual energy and strength. And I say that for two reasons. One, this is just the way the kingdom works. This is how we grow. But two, it's important to take the pressure off, I think, especially in the beginning. If you start reading the Bible and it doesn't make sense, it makes you feel confused, even a bit disturbed, then I just want to say, don't worry. 
Just keep at it, and eventually it's going to click. You see, I think we go to some passages in the Bible, and it looks like that, <laughs> okay, which to me looks like a complete mess. You know, I wouldn't know what was going on there. At best, confusing. At worst, scary. And it's a bit like learning a new language, where in the beginning, you, it just doesn't make sense. There's all these sounds, and you don't get it. Remember, we've said that the Bible is meditation literature. It's meant to be read and reread because there are truths over here. Once you understand that, it becomes the key to understanding the Bible over here. Without this key, this just doesn't make sense. But eventually, you begin to have enough keys in your heart that you can begin to understand it all. So the language that originally looks like nonsense, we don't get it. That's biblical Hebrew. For those of you, I, know, I see some of you nodding like, I, I could read that perhaps, you know. Um, and, but suddenly you begin to get a few clues what's going on. And you shall love what? Who? Yahweh, the Lord, your God. Anyone can guess what's coming next with all your hearts. It's like, wow, we had enough keys to understand what was actually coming, that we don't just know God with our minds, but we begin to love him with our emotions as well. So we want to be really practical in this time. How can we begin to sow the word of God into our hearts in a way that we are going to be changed? Well, here are some of the things we need to do. These are like the essentials. Is there more? Absolutely there's more. But you don't have to worry about the more until you at least get going. You know, sometimes with this, it's like we want to learn a language and we want to begin by translating one of the most difficult passages in the Bible. No, you begin with the alphabet. And then once you know the alphabet, you can learn a few key words. And then you can go. And that's hard for us because we're adults. We're used to engaging at a high level. And then we've got to start at the beginning. And that can feel weird. But it's not. If we just follow the process, we will see within the course of a week, a month, a year, 10 years, our whole life is in a different space and environment. So here's the first thing. We need to get started. It's going to take some time but not as much time as you maybe think. Even just five minutes a day, that's less than one of our worship songs sometimes. Five, day, five minutes a day for five days a week, and you can cover the entire New Testament in a year. Imagine how the field of your heart would be different by the end of that. And we actually have a study guide here, which we prepared earlier. <laughs> which is the 555 study guide where you can do five minutes a day and you do it five days a week and there's even time for catch up because sometimes we miss, okay? And you get to cover the entire New Testament in, in the course of a year. I'd really, if you've never done that before, that could be a great thing for you to do. For those of you uh, perhaps who want to dedicate a little bit more time, maybe you've done this already, we've got another study guide here. This is to be able to do the, Bi the whole Bible in a year. It's been put together by the Bible Project. What's amazing with this, as you open it up, we'll email all of this out to you so you've got it digitally as well, is corresponding to each reading, the Bible Project have put videos in to be able to explain key concepts that perhaps appear in that passage or overviews of the Bible or that particular book. So now you're reading it and you have this whole big picture of what's going on. And in the digital one we email out, you can just click on it and it'll take you straight there. You watch the video and then you can read the passage of scripture and hopefully the lights will come on even at a different level for you. Okay, but take whatever is going to perhaps be most helpful. It's going to take some time. We have to, and isn't God worth it? And, and, and isn't it worth it to close your eyes and look into the field of your heart and know you have what you need to live? Because I can't give it to you. I can't give it to you. Nobody can. You need to go before the Lord and let him sow it with you into your own heart. Second thing is, you're going to need a Bible, <laughs> okay? Now, I would encourage you to get a physical one 
rather than a digital one where you read it on your phone. No problem with reading on your phone, you know, at different times when you don't have it around, but it can be quite confusing to read a Bible on your phone because you don't know where you are. There's no sense of scale, or you can't, it's hard to see where you are in the story. It's hard to find that passage of Scripture again. Whereas if you take a physical Bible and you begin to read through it and you begin to know, oh, this is kind of here, this probably follows this in the story, and you begin to get, you can highlight in it so you kind of know and remember, and you come back to read it again. You're like, oh, I've read this before. Funny, I don't remember it at all, but, <laughs> you know, I've, I must have read this before, and or you remember how God spoke to you when you read it before. And so it, I, I would really encourage you, if you can, to get a physical Bible. We've got a bunch of them here if you want to come and have a look. If you are going to buy a Bible, I really encourage you to buy one with what has, it's called a reference column. So if you have a look inside here, we don't have them in our pew Bibles uh, or in our, our church Bibles, but down the middle, there's a reference column which has other scriptures in it. And, and this is one of the best ways to read the Bible. Because you read something you think, I don't know what's going on here. You look at the reference column and it will tell you what other scriptures are related to this passage. So that you know what, what truths am I meant to be bringing in here as the keys. Now, if you know the whole Bible off by heart already, you don't need the reference column. Okay, so you can save the paper. But if, like me, you can't hold it all in your head yet, the reference column is really helpful. Obviously, if you can get a study Bible, if you can afford one, um, that's going to be helpful too. Because it will just it's like having someone in the room with you to explain some of the basic things that can be really important in being able to understand it. Now, tr um, translation is a question that we often get asked about. What's the best translation to have? You know, if you can't read the Hebrew and the Greek for yourself, which many of us can't. So uh, I think... I put this into two categories, if you, if, if you, you might want to take a note of this. So if you have never read the Bible before on your own, you've never read through it before, I would encourage you to get a translation that is as easy to read as possible. Sometimes it's known as a, a, a dynamic equivalence or a concept-for-concept concept translation. So they're not trying to do a word-for-word they're trying to do a concept for concept. The NRV is kind of sitting in the middle with this. So if you've never read the scriptures before, NIV is maybe the most complex you'd want to go for, but perhaps you could go for a CSB. Is a great. We've got an uh, example here, or the New Living Translation, um, or uh, perhaps, as I say, the NIV. Um, yeah, come and chat to me if you want some help with, with that. If you've read through the Bible before, and you're a little bit au fait with the language and the culture of the Old Testament and the New Testament, you want to do something to teach from. So I wouldn't normally study out of those Bibles. I would study out of more of a word-for-word -word translation. So something like the ESV or the New American Standard Bible or the New King James, those tend to be, or the Amplified Bible, those are more word-for-word, -word, but they require a little bit more work from us to be able to understand the concepts that are behind, because sometimes it's a bit hard to read it out loud. Um, but it's really helpful if you're wanting to study it. Again, we've got a selection of examples there. Third, you're going to need to fight to protect the time to do this. It is uncanny. I mean, five minutes is nothing. It's like the length of the advert break you know, in, in the series that you're watching. And yet, the five minutes that you set aside to read the Bible will become the most contested time in your life. You know, it just, you know, you sit down and the phone rings, the baby cries, someone has a disaster, the cat knocks something over. You know, it just is, it is amazing how as you get started with this, this becomes the, and you need a fight for that time because it will re be robbed from you if you don't do that. And the reason is, this is the engine to your spiritual life. You, you kind of can't do anything else, really, without having this in place. Because otherwise, what we do, we live on other people's faith, which is never strong enough in the moment of temptation, which is why Jesus says to the enemy in the garden, you know, man shall not live, on bread alone, but every word the Father has spoken to me. And that becomes my strength. 
in order to be able to go forward. So we've got to protect the time. And lastly, as you sit down, I'd encourage you to pray. Because at one level, it's easy to understand the Bible, isn't it? If you're reading it in your own home language. And please do read it in your own home language so that you read it in your first language. So we understand the words, but at a much deeper level, this is a spiritual exercise that we can't do without the Holy Spirit's help. So I've got some prayers here. Now, you might be able to come up with a much better prayer, in which case, don't take the little piece of paper. However, you know, I was reading something about how sometimes when we are tired or we're unwell or we're just feeling flat, it can be helpful to have a prayer to read, not have to come up with one. You know, in those times where you're just feeling weak or you've never really done it before, so we have a little prayer here, Father, Help me to hear what you are saying to me. Holy Spirit, teach me and help me to be good soil when I understand and when I don't. Change me, Lord, and help me to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. And you just pray a prayer like that as you sit down, you do your five minutes, you thank God, and you trust the seed is going to grow. And the next day, you succession plant, and you trust him, and you plant the next seed. And, and ama- it, it just is amazing the way the lights begin to come on spiritually as you begin to do that. Does that sound good? Hopefully, there's a, way, there's a way that we can move forward that's doable for everyone. We're also going to email out some extra resources for those of you who are flying a bit. With this, um, I'd really love to encourage, if you want to go deeper, the Bible Project have done a podcast where right from the beginning, kind of um, sort of uh, biblical theology, where they go through all the themes of the scriptures, they help you to see the big picture of everything. Now, don't start with that. (laughs) That's like, but... If you are going already, that is a great place to come and almost have the the landscape of your mind expanded as you begin to see and understand this kind of intimate web of connections all over the scriptures that are telling this unified story of how we can come to Jesus and be transformed and changed by him. Amen? Okay, we all have a next step hopefully out of this together. So let's, let's take a moment to pray. We need God's help with this. I hope no one is feeling condemned. I know it's so easy. It's one of those topics you, you talk about. You speak about reading the Bible and almost everyone feels guilty because we all think we're not doing it enough. Okay, well, the, <laughs> Jesus is not the one who condemns us. He convicts us, but he doesn't condemn us. Condemnation makes us apathetic and passive, conviction always comes with the seed of hope that things can be different and things can change one step at a time and your whole life can get turned around. Amen? All right, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. So we stand. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Father, and I just, I pray this prayer for all of us. Father, would you help us to hear what you are saying to us? Holy Spirit, would you teach us and help us to be good soil when we understand and when we don't? And when we don't, God, would you help us to trust you until we do? Lord, change us. Help us to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessings, everybody.